So we're talking about from less to functional. And what we did last week is that we took clay as sort of the basis, the, the analogy for this. And we looked at the relationship between the potter and the clay. And we went through the about five steps that this happened, or five critical elements that you need for clay to be properly formed, for clay to 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 go from this, you know, that to to something beautiful. You know, you go to a clay store, like a pasta party store, and you're like, oh my god, like this is so beautiful. But like it started from from that, right? If you go back, to, yeah, it started from this. Like this is what it was before, right? So so how do you go from this to something amazing, something beautiful? Uh, and so, so that's what we were. That's what we're talking about. And we, we said we you needed a few ingredients, a, a few things to make that happen. And uh, if you, well, some of you were were here last week, you you kind of want to share this stuff to me. What 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 was what were some of those things you you, you needed uh, from last week? Let's uh, let's kind of you know. Water. You needed water. That's right. That's right. And we'll go. You know, it doesn't have to be in any particular order. Uh, what else? What else did you, did you did you did you say we needed? You needed vision, vision. So, 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 so the vision comes from God for your life. You are the mound of clay. In order for that clay to be something amazing, it doesn't build itself. It needs vision. Somebody needs to have a vision in their minds what that mound of clay is going to result into. So you need vision. You need the water. And that water, in this sense, is the word of God. So as the, as the potter is sort of, you know, spinning the wheel and working that machine and, and the thing is turning and, and you know, they, they kind of need, you know, they dip their hands in water, kind of have a little sprinkle of water here. That water is to make the clay more flexible. It's to make the clay more, more movable. It's to make the clay, when the water washes over the clay, the clay responds to movement a lot better. Responds to shaping a lot better. We also talked about the fact that we needed motion. The clay, just because there's a vision and there's water in a pot somewhere, doesn't make the clay. There has to be some kind of motion. The wheel is turning, right? So that, that way there's that circular motion. And that's motion not just from God, the potter, but also from the clay. The clay is moving because God could be dancing around the clay. The potter could be dancing around the clay. doesn't mean the clay is getting built. The, the clay is moving and God is moving as well. That, that's important. We talked about eagerness, right? So it's vision, water, motion, eagerness. The clay gladly moves. In fact, what makes great clay sometimes is the, its ability to respond to water, right? God, like, I'm just a little touch here, a little touch there. The clay is there's an eagerness. So you've got vision, you've got water, you've got motion, you've got eagerness, and you've got temperature. This is where we got really deep last week. Temperature is what takes the clay from, okay, that's a nice, wet, well-designed product, to this is something that can go on the shelf. See, to get here, you need temperature. There is something about, there's something about the heat that clay has to go through to get to this. And when we talk about that, that, that temperature, we talk about five stages of clay maturity. Five stages that the clay takes to mature to this. When that amount of because because if you have to play with clay, you know you, you have the design and you put it on the shelf and it, it dries. It's, it kind of kind of looks like funky. It kind of looks like it's there. It's just wet clay. You don't sell that stuff. You don't sell that stuff. So these five stages of maturity. How does that apply to us as believers? How, what does it really mean? And I'm going to be going a little deep today with each one to make sure that we understand as a believer, as a person who is trying to move through the stages of development with God, where do I fit in this part of clay analogy and how does this stuff apply to me? I want to begin by saying that the, the potter's physical process of creation is a, is a spiritual process of becoming more and more like Jesus. That process that the potter takes to create this vision, to bring this vision to life, to create this mound of clay to something that is functional, what happens in the physical is the same thing that happens in the spiritual, but for us, it's us becoming more and more like Jesus. For the physical potter, the vision is a pot, or a mug, or a vase, or something. For God, that vision is one thing, Jesus. So when God takes your mound of clay, there isn't a very, there isn't, oh, 
you know what? Maybe I can make different things. No, it's Jesus. It's one thing that God is trying to do. God is trying to make you and I, the purpose to make you and I more like that singular vision, Jesus. So as the potter is designing and, and creating that vision, God is doing this in the spiritual. So that's, that's important for us to know from the onset. Now, here are the five stages, or the five or six stages of, of clay maturity. When the clay is done initially, off the wheel, the very first thing that happens is air drying. They don't throw it in the fire right away. The first thing is what? Air drying. They leave it on the window shelf or something, and it just dries. Now, I'm gonna, the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to take you through the physical implications and then the spiritual parallel so you really understand it. The physical parallel, the physical implication is that clay at that point still had at least 25% water. Because remember, to make the pot, there was all that water. So the moment you put it on the shelf, on the window, it still has at least 25% water, even if it looks dry. Inside, there's still water. Now, here's interesting, something interesting that happens. When clay is drying, it shrinks. When clay is drying, it shrinks. What's happening is that all the particles are coming closer and closer together to form the hardening. Right now, it's like water. Water is not together. It wants to flow because the particles are loose, right? The more of that water you come, that comes out, the closer the molecules, the closer the particles are, and that's what makes the clay hard. So the first stage is air drying. Now, during air drying, it's very dangerous for the clay. You know why? Because when the clay doesn't dry evenly, it cracks or it warps. Because some part of the clay has more water than the other. In other words, if you put a clay pot wet on the windowsill and the sun is hitting the clay pot on one side and drying out and becoming harder and the other side is not getting the heat, what happens is that now you've got a clay pot, one side hard, one side soft, crack in the middle. So, okay, what's the spiritual implication for us? What does this mean for us? It means that when we are air drying, this is the beginning stages of our relationship with God. Where we first come in contact with that vision that God wants for our life. Okay, this Jesus is the product. This vision, this Jesus is where I want to end up. Okay, great. Now I'm excited about being a believer. But this is also the part where, where we're not careful. We don't allow the water to get everywhere. So we have cracks in our lives. This is the part where, where the, the particles and areas of our life, they're supposed to shrink and start coming together so that we're not so all over the place, but that we have more focus and more focus and more focus on becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what's supposed to happen. When we don't allow Jesus into all areas of our lives, we have an uneven drying. An uneven, in other words, some parts of our lives have more water. What is the water? The Word. Some areas of our lives have more water than others. Oh. Yes. Yes. You know what? You know what happens to us? What happens to us is, is we get selective about what areas of our lives we want God to touch. That's that crack I'm talking about. When Jesus comes into your life, Jesus doesn't come to live in the guest bedroom. When you have a real relationship with God, that relationship is full on. It touches every area. You don't say, well, you know, yeah, I, I, I have a great relationship with God, but, uh, but yeah, definitely, when it comes to my marriage, go cool. When it comes to my money, yeah, you know. When it comes to my money, great. When it comes to my work, what's that got to do with God? See, see, that's air drying. You will have crap. You will have one side of your life that has water, more weight, more word, and another part of your life that is drying out, getting harder. So you will have a crack. You will have a warp in the clay pot is warped because it didn't dry evenly. You know, this is where a lot of churches, a lot of people are. 
because they have an interaction with God, they love it, it's great, they're excited about God, but there's no penetration. Mm. There's no depth, there's no growth, there's no, you don't leave church convicted like, man, I need to, I need to improve my life, I need to do something with my life. I have not started yet. You can come to church, it's great, it's fun, and we love fun, we love community, we love those things. But that's part of that evolved part of our, our model, that's where that comes in. The, the idea is that you change. The idea is that you get better. The idea is that you get deeper. I wonder what part of your life needs to have more water. And I wonder what part of your life God is trying to toughen up right now and you're resisting because you're only trying to dry out one part. You got the sun hitting your life from one area. And you're like, yeah, maybe that's the area. Maybe there's the handle. Right? Everyone wants to touch the handle. Everyone wants to pick up the, the jug with the handle. And everyone sees on the outside that you are a believer, but that heat is not coming on the inside. So when we pick you up, you crack. When life picks you up, you crack. You and I need to allow more of that water to saturate every area of your life. That's air drying. That's Edge Ryan. Edge Ryan is what the Bible refers to being a baby Christian. And there's nothing wrong with that in the sense that, look, we're in this room, we are all at different stages of maturity. There's some people here who have just started beginning that relationship. Great. Maybe they're Edge Ryan right now. Maybe some of us are a little further along. Well, you see, you got to make sure that when you're Edge Ryan, you don't stop at Edge Ryan. Many people have, are having a difficulty with their faith because they thought Christianity stopped at air drying. They thought it was all about the fun and games. They thought it was all, all cute, all, all, all sunshine and rainbows. They, 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 they thought, you, you know, if I'm a Christian, well, then why is this stuff happening to me? It, it, being a believer doesn't mean that your life is perfect. So you can't be stuck at air drying. Here's the second stage. The potter takes the clay, forms the shape, puts it on the shelf to air dry. The second stage is the initial kiln drying. They call it kiln, kiln drying. That's when more heat. They actually put it in this pot or in this, in this oven-like place, and they, and they put the clay. Once it's kind of air dry, they put the clay in there to dry even more. Now, here are the physical implications of the initial cone drying. This happens at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, boiling point. That means that all that water that is still there, I mean, because in initial air drying, you don't feel the water. I mean, you feel the clay pot, it's not wet to touch. So everyone could assume that all the water is gone. This is where people meet you and assume that. Since you're a Christian, you're perfect. And, and you've got it all wrong because as you and I know, none of us are perfect. We're still, I mean, we, we are believers, but we're still, we still have a long, long way to go. But that initial kiln drying is when the clay pot or whatever it is is really is exposed to about 212 degrees Fahrenheit of pure of heat to bring out all the water deep, side, deep down inside it. Let me explain this way. Sometimes we go through trials that test our character to bring out the water, uh, bring out the word that is already supposed to be in us. Sometimes the word of God in you is there, but in order for that word to come alive, <laughs> to become a weapon of choice, to become something that you actually use in your life, it's not just about, oh, I can't be across the scripture, it's on my wall, you know how you, know, you have a scripture verse by your bedside, mm. no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when the word of God actually begins to be something that you use to affect your life, to pray over your health, to pray over your family, when it becomes something you use, Sometimes you've got to go through some things to bring out that word from you. The bringing out of the word is what makes the word potent. It's not knowing it or having it on your app or having it by your bedside that makes the word potent for you. 
Applying that word to a situation is like having a sword or a weapon or something or a knife in your pocket, and then you're in a fight, but then you're like, well, it's there, you know, my grandpa gave it to me, and I don't want to stay in it right now. <laughs> so you're like, you know, you're taking a beating, right? And you've got that, and that's what that is. It's, it's when you apply that to a situation that that thing becomes potent. Sometimes you go through, you and I go through the initial kiln drying at 212 degrees at just boiling point. Those are the situations in your life that test your character. So that, that's, the, now we get to the spiritual implications, right? You get tested to your boiling point. And we all have that point. We all have that point where you know, everything is all great, everything is all chirpy, until... You're right here, it's all fun and games until, right? You're, you're a nice person until. I'm a patient person until. You know, I'm nice, I'm, you know, I don't know. We all have an until moment. And this moment, this initial kiln drying that we're talking about spiritually is when situations come that take you to the edge. New York City is great for this stuff. <laughs> Right. I was in the subway the other day, and uh, <laughs> I was being pressured this last week. Some people said, I was standing there, I'm minding my business, and you know, I was by a pole, you know, and then somebody, you know, came and stood by the pole, and you know, sometimes you gotta hold the pole low, you know what I'm saying? But now I'm a short guy, you know, and this guy is tall, and he's holding the pole, you know, really high up, and there are parts of his body that are close to my nostrils. <laughs> and, <laughs> Which is cool, but he's also angry at me for standing there first. I, I, it's hard. It's, I, I mean, I I got. I mean, I was, I was probably at two hundred and five degrees. I was I was I was there. I needed the word. <laughs> New York City. New York City can do that. We all get tried, and these situations, folks, they're not meant to break you. They're meant to extract the water out of you. The thing that you know that is right, the word of God that has come in, that has, is, is latent in your heart. You don't have to know all of scripture, but many of us know some kind of scripture. We know some kind of story. Sometimes those situations happen to bring out the water so that we can actually apply what we know is right. And it is in the application of that 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 word becomes potent. It becomes real. Some of us are not having a real enough encounter with the word of God because we are completely avoiding any situation that takes us close to boiling point. We, and when we get there, we are assuming that the reason why we got to a point of boiling point is somehow because God left. That's somehow because God is no longer paying attention. Whereas, it is because sometimes God is paying attention that you get to that point. So many people have stopped becoming, they've stopped, you know, this Christian thing is not for me. This God thing is not for me because, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm going through stuff. I know, like, just hold on. Just hold on. The best is yet to come. I think somebody next to you might want to hear that. Why don't you turn to somebody and just say, the best is yet to come. <laughs> Tell them. Look them in the eye. They, I don't think they believe you. Tell them in the way that they're going to believe you. The best is yet to come. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's take a look at a piece of scripture. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. This is a popular scripture. And, and this is, this, this, when I was preparing for this, I was like, I mean, I've read this over and over again, but I was like, oh, oh, oh. You know, this moment, I had oh, oh, oh moment. Here is Jesus. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. By the way, the thing that happened just before this, can you imagine that? Jesus gets baptized. The Bible says that the clouds open. A dove flies down from heaven, lands on him, and the, a booming voice comes, and God says, this one, this, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. 
I mean, thank God that I'm not, I mean, I, I, see, for so that I can't be God. See, because if I come out of that water, my swag level, I mean, you think I have some little bit of swag right now? If I come out of that water, okay, and a booming voice comes from heaven, we talk about this is my, this is T to the O to the B to the I, that's my boy, I'm proud, I'm God, and this is the, you, yo, you, my, you know, my swag. <laughs> I'm telling you, yo, yo, but no, right after this, the next thing is this. It's incredible sometimes how God works, and you got to let God do the work. The Bible says that Jesus was led by the Spirit. By who? The Spirit. By who? The Spirit. Not by the devil. By who? The Spirit. By the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? Be Wait a minute. The Spirit of God just descended from heaven on him. Boom and voice comes. This is my son, who I am well pleased with. But then, the next thing that happens is that same Spirit. The one that is from God. The one that says that God is so proud of me. That same spirit leads me into the wilderness. Not for some samosas. Not, not for some, you know, some, 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 some good food. Not for a barbecue party, you know, like, you know, like an onboarding. <laughs> okay? Like, nothing. No, no. To be tempted. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is what? It is what? Do you see what's happening right now? Jesus was taken to a boiling point so that the word in him can come out. Jesus was taken to the edge of his abilities as a human being. I mean, you don't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. It'd be nice to have a piece of bread right now. But he said, it is what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but in every word, but in every what? Word. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. That word in him was, done, was aching to come out, and the best place to bring that out was in the place of temptation, in the place of difficulty, in the place of frustration. Sometimes that's how it works, folks. Then by verse 5 says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. Even now the devil is caught the corner of the act. Well, if you're saying it's written, it's written, then maybe I can do that too. But see, that's why you got to know the word of God. It's written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Mm. Jesus answered, It is also written, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So, what is written in the proper context overrides what you are trying to use as an opportunity for me to get out of alignment with God. I know the full story. That's why you and I can't be, This what God is trying to explain to us is that you can't be selective of the part of the Bible that you like. Because if Jesus fell for that trap, what would have happened What would have been, the devil would have said, oh look, the Bible says, you throw yourself off the ground, off the, off the, off the roof here, and your legs are going to touch the ground. Yeah, it's in there. But it's in the wrong context. And I can't pick that part because this overrides that part. I know the full story. And it's written. Again, verse 8. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. And what did he say? It is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus was clearly taken into that position, into that area of frustration, into that area of temptation, because the word in him needed to come out to actually be potent. I wonder what's going on in your life right now that is nothing but your initial clean drive. 
I wonder what's going on in your life right now that is nothing but something God is doing to bring out the word that you know inside of you to actually apply that. Like I said, you don't have to know all of the scriptures. You don't have to cram a thousand memory verses. Some of you, God has been speaking to you for a long time. God has been trying to reach you for a long time. For some of you, there are stories in the Bible that you can't get your mind off of. There are stories in the Bible that just, just touch you in a very interesting way. But you want, if you just let yourself go, if you just let yourself go, here's number three. Dehydration. So what was number one? What was number one? Edge line. Edge line. Number two? Initial pound drying, tongue twister right now. Here is step number three. And the process of taking that wet clay into something that is great. Step three, dehydration. This one happens at 932 degrees. You would think. I mean, after it, after being in that heat, temperature, boiling point, we're good. We're good, right, God? I mean, <laughs> I can't take no more of this stuff. I mean, so I, I'm good. I worship you. Is there a better way to teach me this? Please. I'm good. I'm good. But no, there's dehydration. Here's the physical implications of dehydration. Molecular water is dried up. So, air drying took out the water on the surface. Initial clean drying took out the water that's still kind of in there, but then there's still molecular water. There's still water that you can't see with your eyes. There's still water deep down inside there. Dehydration is the point where there's molecular water dried off. There's an irreversible chemical change in the clay. The nature of the clay itself changes. Also, this is very, the interesting part, you can no longer mix water, you can no longer add water to form new shapes. By this point, the clay has hardened enough where it's no longer like the previous stage that at air dry, you can say, you know what, I don't like this air drying, whatever, I'm going to dump it in a bucket of water and just start over. You can do that at air dry. After initial cleaning, by the time it gets to dehydration, the clay can no longer just be adjusted just by adding new water. By this time, the shape is set. By this time, the clay knows who it is, what it is supposed to be. It is set. Now, there's an interesting spiritual parallel here. This spiritual parallel of dehydration is when you and I get to the point where we are thirsty for God. Where we are thirsty for God. Where we're to the point where we need more and more and more of God. This is the point where we are so dehydrated that we need an we need the, the, we need an influx of the word of God. Psalm 42 verse 1. I love what it says. It says, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you. That is what what the Bible is talking about in this scripture is that dehydration right there. When you're dehydrated, folks, nothing else works. Not a can of soda, not some, uh, nothing else. When you are dehydrated, you need water. In this context, what we call water, that's the word of God. There, you, this is the point in your spiritual maturity where all you need, where you get to the point where all I need is the word. I need more of this word. I need more of Jesus. I've come to the point where it's no longer about Jesus benefiting. In, uh, oh, 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 oh. Thank you, Lord. Um, many of us begin our Christian journey acting as though we are the benefit for God. Oh, let me say that one more time because I don't think I don't think you all understood. We carry ourselves as believers as though we are adding value to God. You know, like we're, we're helping him out. You know, by, by being believers, by coming to church, by, 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 by caring for our neighbors, by, care, by loving people, by reading scripture. Like, you know, like we're adding value to him. Whereas, in reality, in reality, dehydration gets us to the point where we are thirsty. We know that we cannot. When you are dehydrated, it is like dying. I wonder. I wonder if you're there. I wonder if you've come to the realization in your life of 
how much you need God. I wonder if you've come to a realization in your life how much value God actually adds to your life as opposed to the other. Now, 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 don't get me wrong. I'm not saying your life is perfect right now. I'm not saying you have everything together. I'm just saying that what is happening on the outside in your life, the physical, your job, your, your possessions, your money, your pocket, those things don't define your soul. In the eyes of God, you are more than those things. So how is that part of your life doing? Because sometimes we think, well, because my physical life is not doing well, so I guess, you know, I don't know. I, I, this God thing is just, you know, when I, when I fix this, then I'll take that more seriously. You know, the church right now is just not, you know, you know, I'm still dehydration. It's a point where we get to where we are convinced that we need God. It's a point where you realize that the clothes on your back were made from sheep that he made. It's a point where you're driving your car and you're like, yeah, Toyota kind of designed it, but they did not make iron ore. Somebody put it there. It's a point where you realize that the food that you have to eat, somebody, somebody created a system in Genesis 1 where he said, these plants have their seeds in them so that they can reproduce and continue to be available for food. It's a point where you connect everything that you have, that you own, that you hope to get to a source. Dehydration, as believers, is when we get to the point where we know for a fact that God is the source. The source has given all these things to other people so that they can put it in packages that we call whatever. Restaurants and, and, and automobile companies and clothes stores and what where is the source though? You know what? You know what the the the, the pity of the situation is that as people, we have replaced the intelligence that God gave us with our own self-intelligence. Because we think now that we know, now that we understand how a baby is born, we think, yeah, we can just make this stuff in a lab. And we think that now that we understand the weather, and we can tell you what the weather is going to be six months from now, that somehow there's no God that's involved in that process. We think that the more, what God had in mind is that the more you understand these things, the more you're in awe about the greatness of, and the attention to detail that this God has. What we do is that we understand things more and more, and we think, well, we don't need him. It's dangerous, though. Because God does not share his glory. God will let you, you know, he's faithful, he's kind, he's patient. He, you know, you, you go plunging around and, 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 you know, one day you're, you know, praise God. The other day you're like, I don't know about this God thing. Oh, it's cool, he, he's patient. But God is God. And we talk about the love of God all the time, but just don't forget that there's the other part of the equation where he's, he's all powerful. There are certain things that, that Google can't answer. Okay? There, there are certain things that are beyond I mean, what are the, you have cycles in your life, things that are going on generation to generation, and you think it's because it's because you're in New York City? Because your family is based in this, or because of, of the, there are some deep spiritual things that are affecting our lives every day. That's dehydration. Here's point number four, the point that will probably stop today. And that is burn off. Stage number four. Burn off. So what's stage number one? Stage number two. Stage number three. Stage number four. Burn off. Burn off is uh, burn off is kind of crazy <laughs> because you know you would have thought air drying is hot enough, but no, we're gonna go to initial air drying, 212 degrees. No, that's not good enough. I'm gonna take you into more stuff. Then we're gonna get dehydration. Right? No, no, it's not, you know, couple steps more. Burn off. That's the sound screen. Because if you look at what a kiln is, 
is it's hot. So what's burn off? Here's the physical implications of burn off. Organic and inorganic materials are burnt off at 1,652 degrees. Every organic and inorganic material in that piece of clay that found its way there, some dead fly from a thousand years ago, you know, some mosquito that happened to be there, all that stuff goes. Goes. At burn off. Here is the implication for us spiritually. This is the point of deliverance. This is the point where every internally and externally initiated cycle or oppression that has been happening in our life, this is the point where they come face to face with the raw power of God and gets burnt off. It is possible to be a Christian, to be a believer, and go through years of coasting through. Things are kind of okay on the surface. Sometimes you need for to break certain cycles in your life. Every first woman in your family, you look at the fat past seven generations, that one thing's been happening today. No, it is no longer a coincidence. Deliverance needs to take place right there. Every firstborn in your family, every male child, just happens to have a difficulty in this one area of your life. Yo, it is not a coincidence, yo. This is deliverance that is waiting to happen. Some part of your life needs sometimes to come into contact with the raw power. You know, the thing, the crazy thing about the enemy is that the enemy can operate in your life. In fact, the enemy does operate in your life, especially when you're ignorant. So just because you can't sense it doesn't mean it's not there. The wind blows. It's so amazing to me when, when you try to explain spiritual things sometimes. There's a lot of resistance sometimes because like, I don't know how that makes sense. But you can stand outside and the wind can blow your shirt so hard that you are moving. You can't see it. But in that, in that sense, you accept it. Oh, so why do you wash your hands every four hours? Well, yeah, you could, you know, the, the germs. Can you see them? No. But no. But no. Before you eat, I'm like, I, gotta, I gotta wash my hands. Oh, but you can't see the dirt. You, 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 you appreciate that analogy in that sense. But no. When we are talking about there are some things that are happening in your life that you can't sense that are still affecting you, like, mm, I don't know. Perfect environment for the enemy of your soul. You know what's interesting to me? Many times we pray. We, we, we try to connect to a God. We try to connect to, to, to good things, right? It's, we call it you know, good energy or whatever they're trying to call God. It's great. But the moment you start talking about like there's a yin and a yang, you can't be talking about like, God, please let that be broken. Please understand that as you are praying to that God, there is also a force that is working very hard against your life. Can't have one without the other. Burn off. Deliverance from internally and externally initiated cycles of oppression. It is also the deliverance from self righteousness. When you get to the point of burn off, you are no longer dependent on your sense of, well, I'm a good person. You know, I'm a, I'm a righteous person. You know, I, go to, I grew up in church. That stuff goes out the window. You know, I, I read my Bible, goes out the window. You know, I, you know, I pray all the time. You know, there was, you know, one time I prayed, all that stuff, all that, all that sense of, you know, I am better than this person because I'm a Christian and they're not. Or, or you know, I've been going to church for a long time and they're just starting. That stuff goes out the window. You know why? Because by the time you get to burn up, you come face to face with how inadequate you are to meet the standards of God. By burn off, you come to the point where it doesn't matter how long I've been a Christian, it doesn't matter how, many, how much scripture I know, it doesn't matter how good I feel about myself, how righteous, I need to depend on God every day, and there's no difference in the eyes of God. When it comes to value, God sees the same value. You've been going to church 10,000 years of your life, and somebody just walked into church today, both of you, in the eyes of God, God just loves both people so much. So where is the need for self-righteousness? It, it, it doesn't exist. That's where you get to burn off. 
that is important enough. Have you reached born enough in your life, or are you still kind of walking around with like, no, I'm not, I'm not perfect, but I'm, a, you know. Because someone like David will tell you, if he was still alive, I heard the voice of God. God was so good to me, but when push came to shove, I let God down. Moses will tell you, I heard the voice of God. I walked with God. He, he, he appeared to me in a way that he never, and yet, when my pride, my self-confidence, my anger issues were not delivered, it showed up and I couldn't take a simple instruction. God said, speak to the rock, and I hid it. And I'm Moses. I have not much relationship with God. I have not much history. I have not much audible, straight-up relationship with God. And I... I, Moses, I can't even follow a simple instruction. That is burn up. When you get to that point where you're like, you know what? If I'm going to be this person, I need to depend on God for it. I need to, I need to look at my fellow brothers and sisters who are st still learning and still coming up and still trying to figure this, this thing out. I need to relate with them exactly how God would want me to relate, which is to encourage them, to love them, to, to answer their questions, to be there for them. That's a burn-up. There's a scripture, Psalm 66. This psalmist is saying, you have tested us, O God, and you have purified us like silver. You have tested us and you have what? Purified, purified us like silver. How are you doing with your tests of life right now? Or is God on the edge? You know, are you treating God like, you know, that friend, you're like, oh, yo, you're testing me right now, bro. Because that friendship right now is on the edge. Is God like your boy who is testing you right now? Your family that's te you're, you're testing my patience right now. Or are you submitting yourself to the burn off? First Peter chapter 6, chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. This, this, is, this is amazing. It says, it says, in all of this, you greatly rejoice. Watch this. So now, for a little while, everyone say for a little while. A little say while. like you're alive. For a little while. For a little while. for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come, these trials have come, so that the proven genuineness of your faith, in other words, these trials are coming to bring out the true genuineness, not the surface, like, oh yeah, but like the true, like the true depth, the genuineness of your faith. Which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, the result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Let me explain that stuff to you because I don't want you to miss it. What he's saying is that gold, even though it is precious, it goes through fire. And even though it is precious, goes through fire, it still perishes. So if something that doesn't last forever has to go through the fire, how much more you that are actually souls, not just bodies, if something that doesn't last forever has to go through the fire for purification, how much more you who will last forever? If gold has to go through purification and it doesn't last forever, Surely, you that will last forever, surely it makes sense that you go through certain levels of purification as well. Surely, surely you need to go through some moments of deliverance as well. Surely, you too need to go from glory to glory as well. Surely you too need to go from air drying to a little bit of heat to bring you to your breaking point and to break off your character, to bring you to dehydration where you're starting to thirst more and more, to look out more and more for the Word of God, to, to try to investigate more the Word of God, to try to understand more the Word of God. And then get you to the point of burn off where everything that is in you 
organic, inorganic, things that have come there from before, all that stuff just So what I want you to do right now is I want you to just bow your heads. And we'll, we'll take care of the, of the last two next week and talk about some other things. But, but, but there, I mean, and those are, it, it, it really gets deep next week. But, but, but your prayer today, what, what I want you to focus on in your mind today is to just ask God, help me, help me not to break through these moments of difficulty that I'm going through. Help me not to crack under the weight of my frustrations, under the weight of my difficulties, under the weight of my frustrations. Help me not to crack. Because sometimes for a lot of people, the thing that sends people over the edge, when you hear some of these stories, sometimes it's not a lot from your angle. But from their angle, it was a lot. Took them right over the edge. Some of the things you're going through right now, other people are going through and not having a great time at all. Like we shared last week, every type of clay has a different relationship with heat. There's some types of clay that reach the point of maturity earlier at different temperatures. We're all different. So you so you, we're all going through different things. So you just got to ask God, help me not to crack under the difficulty that I'm going through. Help me not to break. Help, help me to, to manage my, the things that are not working in my life right now well enough that I still maintain my relationship and connection with you, that I still have hope for tomorrow. Some people are going through so much, they don't even have the hope for tomorrow, to get out of bed in the morning, to face the day. You take this stuff for granted. There's some people going through some, some mad stuff, you know, some crazy stuff. So when your time comes, when your difficulty comes, just say, God, just help me. Help me. Help me. 